is no need for her to apply for leave to cross-examine because if there is no statement, there is no evidence by any witness implicating her in regard to a particular part of the terms of reference, then there is nobody to cross-examine. Where, 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 where she says, this is what Mr. Jonas has said about, or has said, was said about me by somebody, we can deal with that in due course, but where there isn't any witness as yet who has said anything about her, um, she, she needs to wait until there is a witness who says something, and then that's the witness she would want to cross-examine. So as I see it, what you should be looking at is, or what she should be looking at is, um, in principle, applying for leave to cross-examine witnesses who have, or a witness who has given evidence that she contends implicates her. May I interpose, Chair? Yes. There's a challenge to that reasoning, meritous as it sounds. Remember, the, the processes of the Commission started with openings. Then we're in a stage where you're gathering what's on the mind of this competent team of the mm. evidence leaders. Mm. Pose yourself this question, and I'm forced to give you if. What if they say, Mr. Jonas came and testified and said that the Guptas mentioned that they work with certain people and those people are protected, and amongst them is Ms. Lynn Brown. Firstly, they will say if you don't join issue in cross-examining on this issue. And I assure you that we may even ask two questions or three questions to no, Mr. I, Jones. I, I think in so far as she relies on what a witness who has come before the commission has said, that stands on a different footing. We can deal with that. I'm simply saying, what I was saying earlier on is simply that to the extent that you talk about what the terms of reference say in circumstances where there isn't any witness who has talked about that part of the terms of reference, there is no need to, for her to apply for leave to cross-examine now because there is no witness to cross-examine. But to the extent that she is saying, here is a witness who has come before the commission who has said A, B, C about me, I would like to cross-examine. That we can look at. Indeed. Are we on the same page? Indeed. But might we add in parenthesis yes. about something which hmm. the evidence leaders should take note of? Hmm. They consult witnesses. Hmm. They analyze what witnesses say. Hmm. They prepare witnesses. Hmm. Now, if you look at Rule 3.3 and the sub Rule 3.3.1 and 3.3.2, mm. the rules mention of a person who may be implicated. This mm. is a leverage that the evidence leaders enjoy. Mm. When they look at the terms of reference, let, let's look at the terms of reference during this phase of the hearing. Mm. Term of reference 1 to 3, 1.6. Now, those terms of reference informs one about witnesses who may be implicated, even if they have been prepared statements. The question to be posed is, should a witness or should a person wait to be implicated or wait to be notified before they come before the commission? Mm. Now, no one is better qualified to provide an answer to this. And we saw it happening. And this is an issue of Ms. Brown. She says. Mr. Jonas mentions her name, directly implicates her. But Mr. Jonas goes further that <coughs> there's been deliberations and unfairness in as far as the manner in which Treasury has been treated. And she says that point might even may implicate her further. No, I am, I, I, I'm quite happy for us to deal with the question of 
with her application in so far as she relies on what Mr. Jonas testified. We can deal with that. I, 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 I understood you to be wanting to also rely on what I thought would be certain parts of the terms of reference to say they implicate her. Not at all. If, even before there is a witness. Me, me, that's, me. Not your, that's not what you want to do. Not at all, Chair. Okay, no, that's We fine. are saying no one is better qualified to analyze this terms of reference. To appreciate what Rule 3, point 3, Rule 3.3.1 3 and 3.3.2 3 says than this competent team. If you look at those terms of reference, they already tell this competent team of evidence leaders mm. who may be implicated by nature of the term of reference. Mm. Whether that person or that individual has already filed a notice to appear, mm. whether that person has already made a statement. And Chair, with respect, mm. the wisest way of avoiding prejudice is not to deal with it when it is occurred. In the case of Ms. Brown, we contend the following, that if it happens in the future, she hasn't joined issue, she hasn't filed a statement yet, she hasn't given a notice yet, she has not been given a notice, and she gets implicated, would like to be notified. And no one is yes. better qualified than our colleagues, yes. because they read these terms of reference, yes. they prepare, and like we mentioned in parenthesis, Chair, mm. the, the terms of reference that were being dealt with during this phase, by implication, directly or indirectly, should have informed them that there are certain persons who will be implicated. I'm not saying Ms. Brown should be implicated. She's not demanding that right. For instance, let's take term of reference 1.1. May, 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 maybe before you do that, it might not be necessary to do that. Maybe uh, your, uh, the stance that she takes is based on a certain understanding of the provision in the rule, in the rules that talks about an implicated person or a person who may be implicated. Uh, as I understand it, that may be implicated is not talking about somebody who may be implicated in the future. It's talking then they are supposed to err on the side of um, caution and say, we are not saying necessarily you are implicated, but it may be that it may be argued that you are. So we are giving you a copy of this statement. Obviously, you will take your own view, you know, and then take it from there. So as I understand it, that's the, that's the intention. It's not to say it's somebody who may be implicated in the future. So, and, and, the, and the rules are clear that the commission's legal team, when they have taken a statement from a witness, they must look for people who may be implicated or who are implicated and make sure that those are notified and are finished with uh, something that tells them in what way they are implicated or may be implicated in the statement or a copy of the relevant portions of the statement or the whole statement. Um, and in regard to persons who might not be implicated when a statement is taken from a certain witness but get implicated when a witness gives evidence in the commission I have already announced last week that uh, in regard to those, the Commission's legal team will make sure that persons who may not have been implicated in a witness statement but who get implicated during the giving of evidence will be notified. So if and when in the future any witness comes up here and uh, implicates your client, um, and uh, that uh, witness's statement before the giving of evidence did not implicate her, she will be notified. So, so it seems to me that we must just talk about 
whether you should be granted leave to cross-examine Mr. Jonas in regard to the aspects of his evidence to which reference is made in your client's affidavit. Thank you, Chair. But before I part ways with this aspect, this will be the last point mm. I would like to make. Mm. Chair, your interpretation of may be implicated is under-inclusive. Mm -hmm. The answer is in the sagacious and proper preparation of the evidence leaders. As they prepare, assisted by the terms of reference, they've got to prepare this witness. They sit with this witness. There's no one who does it better than them. The defense team and other interest groups and parties do not know. The question is, are they clairvoyant? And that's not what we are saying. Could they anticipate that this witness in the stand may implicate someone? The question is, it's likely no one knows it better than them. Yeah, and, and but, what, but uh, where the statement, as, as I've just said, doesn't seem to implicate a particular person, if, they, if that witness subsequently, when he or she gives evidence, implicates somebody that they didn't think was implicated, they would notify the person. So where is the problem? Now, I could respond to this answer by what we are dealing with. Let's come nearer home. What is it that you want the, 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 legal, the commission's legal team to do, which they have not done? Leave out the fact that um, you say they didn't give you Mr. Jonas' statement because um, I don't know whether even as we speak they haven't given you, but uh, I would think that they have by now. In terms of the rules, it's clear that if your client was implicated, they should have given, give, given the statement. They may have taken the view that your client was not implicated, and that may be a bona fide view, and they may be right, they may be wrong. Your client might take a different view. And uh, to the extent that Mr. Jonas or any witness in the witness stand implicated your, 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 your client, that's what we can talk about in terms of whether you should be granted leave or not. And uh, I'm inclined to say, why don't we just get to that? Namely, where there is a witness who you, you submit implicated your client, and we talk about that. Or is, 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 there, is, there, is, there, is there some submission you still wanted to do outside of that? No. We'll close by saying we, we, we're not future. closing any door to your client. The attitude is simply that as and when there is a witness that your client believes implicates her, you can come forward and apply for leave to cross-examine that witness. In other words, the leave to cross-examine is not just granted in general. It's granted in respect of specific witness and specific evidence. Chair, we close by saying the following into the future. The terms of reference do guide our colleagues. I think their fairness instincts and judicial training would inform them that dealing with this ter term of reference, there are high probabilities that members of the executive will be implicated. A member of the executive who was responsible for this state-owned entities would be implicated. But the answer is not even on the defense team or members of the national executive who may be implicated. It's in the training of our colleagues. They're better qualified to use those instincts to say, this term of reference brings to the fore this particular department on the spot and the person who headed it. Now, the answer and is... And what should they do at this stage if there is no witness who has implicated them in a statement? I'm addressing, Chair, what is occurred. Hmm? But I, 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 I what is I'm occurred? confining myself to what is occurred in the case of Ms. Brown. Yes, as I understand it, she didn't get served with Mr. Jonas' statement originally. I don't know whether subsequently she has, is that right? 
up till now she hasn't. Okay. We've requested oh, and, and that might be because the legal team might have taken the view that the Mr. Jonas statement doesn't uh, implicate her. That's a, that's a possibility. Uh, now, uh, you maintain that you, 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 she is implicated. I'm sure the, the legal team can give you that, that statement and, uh, and then you, 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 you move your application. And uh, I'm just concerned that we are getting detained uh, on something that uh, really shouldn't detain us because uh, you can get the statement if you haven't got it. If they take the view that your client is not implicated and you take the view that it's implicated, you make submissions to me, I listen, I take care of you, I make a decision, we move on. Thanks, Chair. Wouldn't the answer be I'm just about to part ways and leave extricate myself from this podium. Wouldn't the answer also be the following? The evidence leader could say, you are implicating this particular person. This person is not here. Shall we stop? And not with a view to delay the proceedings, to go and notify that person. Now I'm bringing this point nearer home about what has happened to Ms. Brown. As to what happens subsequent there to Chair, it will take its own course. No. Well, the, the rules make provision for the chairperson to make an order or decision that will uh, try and make sure that an, an implicated person who didn't get notice uh, in time is not materially prejudiced and in effect, that simply means we, we could uh, continue with the evidence of that witness and uh, allow in due course uh, that uh, implicated person to apply for leave to cross-examine and they can cross-examine and uh, to give evidence uh, as well. Uh, that's what everybody, there are, there are a number of implicated persons who were faced with that situation without even them hearing that that was my approach that I intended adopting, they said on their own, they thought that that approach would uh, ensure that there was no prejudice. Chair, we part by saying the uniqueness of the position mm. of Ms. Brown, qualified by the terms of reference, mm. and what occurred proves mm. the contrary. We'll address and uh, confer with the evidence leaders. if such an instance happen in the next occasion, Chair? Mm. <coughs> well, uh, maybe what should happen is, I, I mean, with regard to, for example, Mr. Jonas, you say uh, he said that Mr. Gupta, Ajay Gupta, or the Gupta brothers, I can't remember, which exactly is attributed to Mr. Jonas having said or said something that included Ms. Brown's name, like we protect them or we control them, I can't remember. Now, <laughs> if you want leave to cross-examine, uh, I mean, I take it that Ms. Brown wasn't there. Uh, Mr. Jonas is just going to say that's what was said. I'm not saying it is so, that's what was said. Let alone that, mm. the context in which we work with her mm. is qualified. The content, what does it mean? Those things never came out, and that's where the issue comes, Chair, when we mm. say the evidence leaders have a greater duty to service this commission. They will do it, Chair, and I've got no doubt that they attempt to do it. For oh. instance, there were incremental questions that could have been asked oh. in relation to that allegation. Perhaps oh. it, could have, it could have assured us and qualified whether is she implicated or not. Now, the question becomes the following in dealing with this aspect. Oh. Who is better qualified to determine 
whether she's implicated or not. Who has to wait? How far should it go? Should it have added beyond what Mr. Jonas said, the Gupta said? Now, all these questions bring the difficulty that we have as to is our colleagues, the evidence leaders, are they better qualified to tacitly assume that the interpretation whether Ms. Brown uh, is implicated or not is flawless? Let's uh, bring finality on this for now. Do you want to let me decide the application before you can see the Mr. Jonas statement? <coughs> or do you want me to defer the application until you or your client has seen the Mr. Jonas statement and uh, decide whether the application must be decided as it stands or or you want to supplement or what? We'll wait to see the statement, Chair. And I don't want to waste the Commission's time. We do have the version. We look at the mm. transcript. Yeah. And it's standing before the Commission. Yeah. yeah. I could read it to you, but as at this stage, yeah. I don't think it's necessary, Chair. Okay. No, no, that's fine. So we'll defer the application and then uh, in due course, I will hear at some stage what your client's final decision is or whether to pursue the application as it stands or to supplement or what to do. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. This application then will be deferred. In regard to um, the applications of Ms. Kaunda, applications of Mr. Mtolo, And, uh, uh, well, Ms. Mnonopi's one was withdrawn. Um, mm, what was the, I leave out Mr. Ajay Gupta, Mr. Rajesh Gupta, Mr. Tutuzane Gupta. Those, those three, uh, I'm sorry. What did I say? <laughs> Mr. Tuduzani Zuma. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm sorry if I said anything different. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm leaving out anybody. Well, I've just dealt with Ms. Brown's one. Yes. Mr. Malek, I'm leave, do I, am I leaving yes. out anyone? Chair, there is the application of Mr. Tongwani, which has not yet been mentioned. Yeah. You will recall that he is being represented by <coughs> Mr. Silier, who made it clear earlier oh, that yes. he would not be here today. Yes, yes, We were yes. going to mention that application. Yes, and yes. Draw your attention to some of its useful features. Well, basically, if I recall correctly, he he wants to testify. Indeed, Chair. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, so I would be inclined to grant that one too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so let me just say, uh, in regard to Mr. Longwane's application, I grant leave to cross-examine the witness or witnesses referred to in his application. In regard to Ms. Kaunda, I grant leave to cross-examine the Ms. Mento. Um, but in regard to that one, I emphasize what I said when counsel was on his feet to say, um, if at all possible, there is a chance that through discussions with the Commission's legal team, uh, that can be dealt with without um, adding on the numbers of people who will come up. That would be great, but uh, if uh, that is not felt to be fair, it's fine. The leave is granted. And in regard to all, to all the applications where I grant leave, the actual uh, time frame I would grant just before cross-examination begins. Um, as to what, how much time I'm allocating. Um, uh, in regard to 
Mr. Mdolo, let me, I was informed that Mr. Mdolo is prepared to give evidence. His counsel, I think, is no longer here, but I think that's what I was told. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I, I, I would uh, grant, uh, uh, I would uh, grant leave in that case as well. Um, uh, I think I've covered all of them. Yeah. And then in regard to the three, um, Mr. Ajay Gupta, Mr. Rajesh Gupta, Gupta Mr. Tutuzana Zuma, those, in regard to those, I reserve judgment. And uh, uh, once I'm ready to hand down the decision, I would uh, let everybody know uh, Oh, you had not argued. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you had not argued. We, 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 we took too much time. You, you said yes. you, are, you, have no, you are not opposing the others, but yes. With, yes. This, with these three, you don't oppose the granting of, of cross-examination. You, you oppose, or you, you rather want certain conditions to be attached. Indeed, Chair. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So I will let you present your argument <laughs> in, regard to you. The, in regard to the conditions that you want to, yes. to attach. Yes. Uh, Chair, I hope not to be long. Um, yes. May I make sure that you have the material mm. that we will navigate through in order to assist you on whether it is appropriate in the exercise of your discretion mm. to impose the condition or conditions that we contend for. Mm. The first bundle you should have, Chair, is the updated Exhibit D3. Yeah. It contains all of the applications that have been made for leave to cross-examine mm. without the accompanying undertaking to testify except mm. for Mr. A.J. Gupta and Rajesh Gupta, mm. who want to testify on their own rules of engagement. Mm. That's the first set of material. The second chair would be the bundle of updated heads of argument. That bundle begins from page one, and it runs up to page 241, as I have it. And, uh, Chair, you have... Uh, what is that bundle written? It's the bundle of indexed heads of argument. Oh, I, I may be having them as separate. Yes. I think at some stage they were all put in one bundle, but I prefer them separate. Yes. Um, uh, Chair, I hope that the separate set you have has been indexed. I can indicate to you that our submissions begin from page 191. I've got your heads of argument, uh, but I don't think that I've got the supplement. Chair, I believe that there is an extra bundle of the indexed set of heads which may be of assistance to you as yes, we make the submissions. Yes, yes. <coughs> and, uh, and those that I had, the original ones, you can take it that I had the opportunity to read them. To read them, yes. Carefully, yeah. And it is for that reason, Chair, that our submissions would not um, involve the reading of what we have said to you earlier on in writing. Yes. We merely focus on three key areas of concern that have emerged in the course of your debate with Mr. Helens and those who support yes. their cause. 
Yeah. And as you understand those areas, uh, whether it is appropriate in the circumstances of the present case mm. to allow the Gupta brothers who are abroad to testify mm. at the venue of their own convenience and comfort mm. outside the jurisdiction, both of our law enforcement agents and the commission. Mm. It's the first issue that we will address. The second issue that we will address, Chair, is whether it is appropriate in the circumstances of the evidence you have heard thus far to impose a restriction that witnesses who are about to be cross-examined should not have the latitude of seeing the versions of implicated parties before the actual cross-examination begins. You will recall it's the theory of precognition so usefully uh, described by our learned friend, Mr. Helens, supported by our learned friend, Mr. Yube. The third issue we will address is a matter of uniqueness relating to the application of Mr. Duduzani Zuma in respect of his attitude that because of the pending criminal proceedings, he is elected not to testify, and yet you should grant him leave to cross-examine. Those are the three areas, Chair, that we would like to address. Yes. I have been asked to mention to you, Chair, that on those three matters, I would not be the only one who would speak, but that the representative of Mr. Jonas would like to make some additional submissions okay. without repeating the arguments I'll advance. Yes. Let me also mention, Chair, that if you go to page 223 of the indexed bundle of the heads, you will find a letter <coughs> written on behalf of Mr. Maseko which records the position that he takes in relation to the present arguments on those matters. I do not wish to repeat what they say. Mr. Maseko is presently represented by his attorney before you today, and what he makes it clear is that they will be guided, they will be guided by the arguments we make. And against that background, Chair, may I start with the first issue, whether you should allow testimony from abroad through video link of some sort. The first point that we would like to make, Chair, is that the issue arises for the first time, not in the application made by any of the Gupta brothers. The issue arises for the first time in the haze of argument. And the issue is conveyed to you not under oath. The issue is conveyed to you through the mouth of the legal representatives. We are direct attention to that matter because there is a fundamental significance to it. And the significance, Chair, arises from the utility of that form of testimony in circumstances where you don't have the power to compel. Classical example is this. If we take what the lawyers have conveyed to you on, the fa on face value, and in good faith we arrange video testimony, and Mr. A.J. Gupta and his brothers are willing to testify. What if in the course of testimony they commit perjury? You will be left at the mercy of their own evidence. You will have no power to compel them. And we know from the recent constitutional court case of the Premier of the Western Cape, 
versus the Minister of Police, which we reference in our heads, that a commission without the power of compulsion is not worthy of investigating the mandate entrusted upon it. You will recall that in that case, the issue was whether or not the commission established by the then Premier of the Western Cape, oh, she's still there, to investigate allegations of police neglect on law enforcement duties in Kyalicha would have the power to subpoena and compel police and other members of law enforcement agents to appear before the commission. And the police took, took a different view. But the Constitutional Court had to remind the police that the commission of that kind had the power to compel. It is for that reason, Chair, that we place... And that was part of that judgment. Indeed, Chair so that the wisdom of the judgment ought not to escape you in the context of the current controversy. We would submit here that the type of undertaking made through the heads of arguments by the Gupta brothers is not worth the promise it is made of. It's not worth the paper. Because they may wake up one day and decide that they're not going to participate in the commission's inquiry. My learned friend, Mr. Philip, who has been des designated to cross-examine them, may well put tough questions on them. And in the course of that engagement, they may choose to disengage. You have no powers to compel them, Jay. Fundamentally because your powers of compulsion are limited by the principle of extraterritoriality. You cannot engage compulsive com powers of compulsion outside the jurisdiction of this country. So that for that reason, we treat with skepticism that type of undertaking. It means nothing. So there are also practical concerns that we have in regard to that undertaking, Chair. The first is that our law, as we understand it, it provides for courts processes to procure evidence abroad through commissions. And the overarching principle is that it must be convenient not to a party in the litigation, but also to the court and the court processes. And convenience in this case is vital given the overarching credibility of the commission. It will, of course, be convenient to Mr. A.J. Gupta and his brother that they should testify from abroad. But it would not be convenient for the commission, let alone the public. On the matter of convenience, we would simply raise the specter of the cost implication of that exercise. You are not dealing with persons who say, we undertake to bear the extraordinary costs of taking evidence from abroad at a place of our convenience. They don't even give us an appreciation of what is the cost implication of that exercise. They don't even tell us how the public interest would be served by such process. Because we know that the proceedings of this commission ought to be public and the public must hear the evidence. And we would think that that type of process, Chair, does not conduce to public interest. Um, a point that occurs to me now, which, I didn't, uh, which didn't occur to me earlier when Mr. Helens was on his feet, is this, that uh, as we speak now, Leave is being sought, they seek leave to cross-examine <coughs> the witnesses who have uh, given evidence that implicates them. Um, having regard to the terms of reference, the wide terms of reference of the Commission, it is not beyond imagination that in the future there may be other witnesses who may implicate them 
in regard to other aspects of the investigation of this commission. And uh, the question would arise if one was thinking of acceding to their request uh, to go overseas to hear their evidence, to say, does it mean until the commission finishes, would the commission have to undertake a number of trips whenever there is a witness that implicates them? Yes. Uh, of course, uh, maybe an alternative might be that uh, all witnesses, and they might have to wait until all witnesses who may implicate them have given evidence uh, before the commission were to then go overseas and listen to their evidence. But if that were to happen, it would have to be quite a, a huge operation, I would imagine, because it would mean that this commission would have to sit in another country for quite some extended period, and those witnesses who would have given evidence uh, here would have to, to be taken overseas as well, to be cross-examined if we were to use that route. Yes. If it's a video link, we would have to keep on having the video links uh, over some time. Yes. Um, okay, I'm just mentioning a thought that's come, come to it my is, mind. It is in the dramatic effect of the examples that you have put to me mm. that therein lies the difficulty of mm. the undertaking by the Gupta brothers. Mm that the specter of those possible difficulties mm. illustrate that the undertaking they make is worth mm. nothing mm. and that we should not place mm. any faith on it. Mm. Mm. Che, of course, our learned friends may respond and say that, but there is no evidence that they would not cooperate with you. Well, the difficulty is they have not come under oath to say so. Mm. But even if we take that proposition on the face value of the heads, mm. we know that those who have had longer lives than us, mm. and therefore the wisdom of prudence, mm. have always cautioned us mm. that the road to hell mm. is paved with good intentions. Mm. Mm. And we don't want to risk that road. So, 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 at least, at least the, well, I, I don't know what cost one talks about in terms of a video link, but certainly in terms of the option of the commission traveling to sit outside of South Africa for purpose, for, for, for their, to, 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 give effect to their undertaking. Uh, it could involve huge costs of taxpayers in terms of taking the commission uh, and whoever else over there. Yes, and, and I'm sure we know that resources have become scarce, especially financial resources. Can you imagine the public outcry that you as the chairperson will have to face? Mm that you are now going to seek additional financial support from the executive to fund a trip to Dubai, <laughs> to go and hear evidence. I'll leave that issue, Chair, but there are two additional points that I'd like to make on mm. that undertaking by the Gupta brothers. The first is the implication of their status, as we call them, fugitives of justice. Mm. On the proposition of our learned friend, Mr. Helens, no one has ever told them that they are a fugitive from justice. Mm. But let's deal with the issue on the face of what they have conveyed to you in the heads of argument. That they have no faith in our law enforcement processes, 
because of their incompetence and the full might they might bring to bear on the Gupta brothers because of that incompetence. The situation is even worse on their approach because on their approach they don't trust our law enforcement processes and the trust doesn't end there. They don't trust that the judiciary would come to their assistance in case there is an abuse of law enforcement processes. And I do recall, Chen, that after we had debated the Minister of Finance, Standard Bank, and other banks versus Ogbe case in Pretoria, the Ogbe group of companies represented by the Gupta brothers won that case, and they professedly proclaimed publicly that they have a faith in the South African judicial system. What has changed in, since then? One cannot allow individuals who adopt these two inconsistent positions to render the processes of the commission useless. Well, of course, uh, uh, one is bound to also ask the question, can you, on the one hand, run away or flee from a legal system and its institutions, but at the same time, want the benefits that that legal system confers on those who participate in it. And, and Chair, Can you do both? Can you say on the one hand, I don't like this system for whatever reason, and you flee? And then, but you say, actually it's got some benefits I would like to get those benefits. Uh, it allows cross-examination. I want to get that benefit even if I'm not participating in it because physically they are not participating. And, and Chair, that's the second last point which creates a serious intractable difficulties for our learner trends because the purpose of the cross-examination they want to pursue it is to discredit the evidence of the witnesses. The purpose of their undertaking to testify abroad is to give you evidence to show that they are not implicated. It's an exculpatory exercise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Taking the two together, they would simply want to make use of the commission's processes to mm. proclaim and advance their innocence. Mm. We test it this way. What if, after that whole exercise, you do find evidence of corrupt, fraudulent, or state capture behavior, and you recommend prosecution? Mm. They are beyond the reaches of the commission. Well, I'm sure somebody in the public could say, they would just laugh at me. Yes, and that's the abuse that we warn against, Chair, because it means that we shall, in good faith, have gone through this rigmarole role and exercise. At the end of it, we can't give effect to the recommendations that you make. And the key question is back the, to the, what, Their refusal to come back into the country and if I understood the affidavits or the whether this was in the affidavit or in the written submissions correctly, the idea is never to come back yes. into the country. Yes. Does it not seek to defeat one of the purposes of, or at least one or more of the purposes of this commission? Indeed. Indeed. Because one of the purposes is that if the commission finds that there were or may have been crimes committed by certain people, 
it should recommend prosecution. Indeed. But if those people who have deliberately fled from South Africa and there are no instruments between South Africa and the country where they are in terms of which they can be forced back into South Africa, then whatever recommendation the Commission could make against them if the Commission found that they were involved in state capture or corruption would uh, not be worth anything. Yes, and Chair, it would have made a mockery of the evidence of Mr. Jonas to the extent that you uphold it. It would have made mockery of the evidence of Mr. Maseko. All of that expensive exercise would become meaningless insofar as they're concerned because they are beyond the reaches of the Commission's processes. Chair, the last two short points I'd like to make on this, on this issue. The first is that our learned friends rely on the Polanski judgment that they and us have referenced in our heads. And no doubt you recall the stage and state of Mr. Polanski and how he sought to evade the justice of the Californian state courts, criminal courts that is, being a French person, and how he sought to utilize the legal processes of England to advance a claim for defamation. There were minority, there's a minority judgment and the majority judgment. They differ on the outcome. But all of them accept that one of the fundamental rules of authorizing video link testimony is that it must be in the best interest of the administration of justice. That principle cuts across the majority and the minority judgment. We don't find that interest of justice in this case. One can understand if you have a fugitive from justice or someone who says, I don't trust your law enforcement agents and I won't come to the country. But who says, I have evidence that will help you as a commission? For instance, a whistleblower whose evidence is so vitally important to advance the terms of reference that you would say in that case, the evidence of that individual is in the best interest of the commission. Nothing of that sort arises in this case. And therefore, the contention of our Lenetrans doesn't go, go past base one of the rules of the commission, the terms of reference, and the commission's regulations, which always say that a witness testimony must be in the best interest of the commission. Nothing of the sort here. Finally, Jane, the good brothers want to have a selective treatment of the law. Mr. Duduzane Zuma had the courage of facing those incompetent law enforcement agents by coming back into the country. What is so different to his business partners? Any suggestion that Mr. Duduzane Zuma must be subjected to your powers of compulsion and not the Gupta brothers arising from the allegations of state capture and or fraud and or corruption would be an unfair treatment of the law to parties who are similarly situated on the course of investigation. And we would discourage that sort of unfair treatment. I asked uh, Mr. Helens when he was addressing me whether it was his submission that Mr. Uh, Ajay Gupta and Mr. Rajesh Gupta have a lawful reason not to come back to South Africa in relation to the business of this commission. And his answer was he gave me what he said were his instructions. What are your submissions on that question? 
Chair, firstly, there is no lawful reason. All of us, all the time, face a prospect of law enforcement processes. If those prospects are well-founded, then we are subjected to the might of the law. If those processes are not well-founded, then we have a judiciary to protect us. If I conclude that they have not advanced any lawful reason for refusing to come back to South Africa and give evidence in this commission, is there really any room for me to consider their application or to, 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 to consider any of the suggestions they have made? Chair, our suggestion would be that you would reject that undertaking and then you would reject their application for the reason that we would reject their application for cross-examination because that cross-examination would not be in the best interest of the commission. It don't help you because the idea behind that cross-examination is to exculpate themselves and not to go to the truth of the allegations. And by the way, at the end of the day, Chairperson, it may well be that you can get better evidence relating to whether they're innocent of the allegations or guilty of the allegations from other sources. And therefore, their evidence is not so fundamentally important. We know that version, Chair, and we have analyzed that version. Mm. They make eight matters of common cause with Mr. Masako, at least Mr. A.J. Gupta. Mm. They make nine points of difference with Mr. Masako's version. Mm. And all of those nine points, Chair, are just bad denials. Mm. Are we going to go to Dubai to listen to evidence that seeks to support bad denials? Mm. We would submit that that is not in the best interest of the Commission, Chair. And so finally, we would submit that, Chair, you would be free and entitled in the exercise of your discretion to reject the undertaking they offer. You would be free to dismiss the application because it is not in the best interest of the Commission's work. Mm. Chair, I then turn to the issue of precognition. We have said a little more in our heads of our argument on that issue. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make two more additional points, Chair, in relation to that issue. And the, the first is, it is based on the proposition which works unfairness on both sides of the testimony you're entitled to receive. The one side of the testimony is through witnesses who have developed the courage to come and tell you what they know about the terms of your mandate and to risk their own career. Implicate people who are the all power and might in our country. Those people do so, Chair, by disclosing their statements to the implicated parties. We have done as far as we could in the pursuit of fairness to give even those implicated parties the bundle of the evidence that the witnesses would converse. You have afforded them, afforded them the latitude to sit here and listen to that evidence so that they know the entire gamut of the evidence that implicates them. And for some reason, that rule of fairness ought not to apply on the other side of receiving evidence because they want to place restrictions on the witnesses. Chair, you have been at pains to point out to our learning trends that you're dealing with an inquisitorial system. You have been at pains to show our learning trends that in fact their approach is not conducive to the proper working of the commission's processes. You gave chapter and verse of examples which show that their approach is not appropriate. You have given the example of a motion court process. There's no answer to it. May we add the following practical considerations, Chair? If Mr. Maseko is going to learn for the first time about the version of the Gupta brothers when it gets cross-examined, practically 
he will be entitled to say, but I want to see that version. I want to have a look at it. His lawyers or ourselves will say, in fairness, you can't cross-examine without giving the witness that fair latitude of knowing the entirety of the version. That's not conducive to the practical, smooth working of the commission's processes. Fairness requires that that witness should know that version throughout and throughout. But the more important part of fairness is this, Chair, that we are working with limited resources in order to make sure that you complete your mandate within the shortest possible time and avoid the costly exercise of business as usual. You have been at pains to say the parties must identify points of common cause and only ventilate by way of oral evidence and cross-examination before you those areas where there's a dispute. The best and the most effective form of making sure that cross-examination takes place on matters that are of dispute and not those that are common cause is to say to the witness, in advance, this is the version of an implicated party. Look at it. Do you still stand by this or that? And we would responsibly come back to you and say that these are the areas which have now been curtailed for proper oral ventilation before you through the forensic skills of examination and cross-examination. But that approach is not conducive to that, Chair. Lastly, Chair. The inquisitorial process before you has an end to it. And the end is not to trick witnesses by cross-examination. The end to it, it is not to scare witnesses to come before you because there is this high and mighty cross-examination. The end to it is to get to the bottom of the truth. My learned friend, Mr. Cockrell, will give you an example of corridor talk how this type of ambush cross-examination may well prejudice the, works, the working of the commission. Yes. We know, Chair, that there are more witnesses to come. Some were reluctant because they did not have faith and trust to the work of the commission. Others were scared because they did not know how they were going to be treated before the commission. Now, if a witness is going to be exposed to this type of ambush cross-examination, we would be depriving the commission of evidence which it would otherwise have had from well-meaning members of our community who want to help you come to the bottom of the truth, Chair. And Chair, in addition to the submissions we made in writing on that score, we would submit that the type of restrictions our Leonard Trends pose are really going to make your work far more difficult than easier. They don't even conduce to the discovery of the truth. They're designed to browbeat witnesses and therefore encourage many, uh, discourage many others to come before you. Shall I then move to the question of the pending criminal case? Oh, Chair, I've been asked to inform you that Mr. Azabam for Mr. Masako is here and he'd like to make one or two points at the end of my submissions. He represents Mr. Masako as Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Chair, on that issue, and let me confess and apologize to you that we did not deal with that issue in our heads. Yes, but you didn't know the point would be taken. We did not know. Yeah. Because it, like the undertaking of the good the brothers, arises for the first time in the haze of argument. Mm. It is not part and parcel of the application. Mm. That issue becomes important because it's not a procedural advantage we seek to gain before you. Mm. It is important, Chair, because our law, as you know, does at some point provide for the court's intervention in regard to a witness who may be facing multilateral processes. And I'll reference the recent judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal, which we gained yesterday evening in the course of our research.
which settled the disparate and different decisions of the higher court and laid down the rule there. But the principle is that our courts do come to the assistance of a person who yes. would be compelled to testify in a civil and or disciplinary proceedings when there is a pending criminal case, purely in order to protect the fair right or fair trial for that person. But the fundamental basis of intervention by the court is that there has to be demonstrable prejudice. You don't intervene, you don't come to the assistance of the affected litigant or witness for the sake of it. You do so in order to make sure that that witness is not exposed to irreversible prejudice in subsequent criminal proceedings. There is nothing in the heads of argument which come close to explain any prejudice by Mr. Duduzani Zuma for his refusal or election not to testify before you. And I emphasize, Chair, it is his own decision. It's an election. And because he made that election, there are consequences to it. I'll come to the question of the consequences flowing from that election. But at this stage, there is no prejudice, Chair. May I at this stage give you the, the citation. citation of the judgment? Yeah. It is Law Society of the Cape of Good Hope versus Randell, R-A-N-D-E-L-L. -L. It is reported in 2013, uh -huh. Volume 3, uh -huh. South African Law Reports. Uh -huh. The judgment begins at page 437 uh -huh. and is a judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal. Uh -huh. Justice Mtiani, then acting as a deputy president of that court, wrote the judgment for the court. And the point he made, Chair, is that prejudice is vital. Absent prejudice, then you can't come to the assistance. And in this case, there's no prejudice. But in case, Chair, you come to the conclusion that we take a strict view of what might be some possible adverse prospects for Mr. Zuma when he goes to the criminal court. The rules of fair play set out in the regulations and also in the rules of the commission do cater on how you could deal with the possible prejudice by Mr. Zuma if he comes before you pending the criminal trial. The rules make it quite clear, I think it's regulation A2 in its amended form, that whatever evidence he or she, he, he would present before you will not be used against him in subsequent criminal trial. And therefore, there is no prejudice that that evidence may be used to procure a conviction against him. And the basis of that rule of fair play in the regulations applicable before you, it's so obvious because one of the rules of fair play in criminal trial processes is that no one should be exposed to self-incriminatory evidence in order to procure conviction. So there is a rule here at play to protect whatever possible or conceivable prejudice, which we don't see. And uh, if I recall correctly, uh, that amended regulation 8.2 was not criticized uh, on his behalf Indeed. today. In fact, it was in quoted anyway. in the head. Yes. yes. So, so, so they, there was no argument to say they would still be prejudiced despite that regulation. Indeed, Chair. Oh. Indeed. So there is a rule of fair play that you may use uh, to intervene, or the criminal courts will be forced to use to intervene on oh. his behalf. Oh. Chair, the th of course, the other one is simply that he has put up the version. Indeed. Um, and uh, and it may well be yes. that one doesn't even have to get to the regulation. Indeed. Indeed. And then that one needs to get to the regulation in regard to somebody who has not put up a, 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 a version. Yes. Or it may well be that one looks at the one and in the alternative looks at the other. Yes. Yes. And Jay, it, it, it's, we listen quite carefully 
for an answer from our learned friend, Mr. Joubert, to the very ringing concern you raised with him. But here, yeah, the man has put up a version. Uh, uh, where is the prejudice there? Uh, where is the prospect of self-incrimination? Uh, the version goes the other way. It's uh, exculpatory. Uh, and so we would submit, Chair, that even before we get to Rule A2, as you rightly point to us, uh, we, are, we think that uh, there is no prospects of unfairness in subsequent criminal trial. Uh, the last point that we would like to make here, Chair, is that this issue of this kind raised by Mr. Zuma is not new or unique to you. It has been raised before in other commissions of inquiry, and we thought it wise to present before you a ruling by Commissioner Gomery, who was tasked by the Canadian judgment to investigate allegations relating to advertisement and sponsorship in a commission established by, can you believe it, the Governor General in Council of the Government of Canada. <laughs> and well, so, uh, well uh, if you look at uh, this country's Commissions Act, you will find that uh, it also still refers to yes. the Governor General yes. of, yes. of South Africa, of the Union of South Africa. Oh, Chair, it's, <laughs> it's a relic, it's a relic which has inappropriately escaped the um, legal advisors of um, the Ministry of Justice for so long. I better keep quiet about it. And, and it says uh, if uh, you are guilty of one of, I think, two or so criminal offenses that it creates, mm. um, you, if a witness is guilty of one or, or two of those uh, or offenses, um, they may be sentenced to imprisonment of, I don't know whether six months, uh, alternatively, uh, a certain amount of pounds. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't which, know whether I don't know whether that sentence is capable of being carried out <laughs> in South Africa. Chair, it's, um, it's, it, it's, it, it awaits a very inventive constitutional challenge at some okay. point. But I wanted to conclude, Chair, by handing a copy of this ruling by yes. the governor. Uh, who made the following ruling in order to cater for the problems raised by persons such as Mr. Zuma. And he says, um, at the same time, I must continually bear in mind the importance of completing this inquiry as expeditiously as is reasonably possible, particularly in the light of paragraph one of the terms of reference, which directs me to submit my report on an agent basis. In the past, some public inquiries have suffered from diminished credibility because of undue delay. I intend to act so as to avoid delay. Repetition and presentation of irrelevant or unhelpful evidence which will not assist me in making the finding called for by my mandate. I read this in the context of the problem you put to Mr. Dubai about the delay. What if the criminal trial does not proceed expeditiously? You will be trapped in the delay workings of the criminal trial. One of the principles which will guide the conduct of this inquiry is that of transparency and openness. However, some prospective witnesses are facing criminal charges relating to the subject matter of the inquiry, and it may be necessary to hear all or parts of their evidence in camera or subject to an order of non-publication in order to assure their right to a fair trial. The rest is there, Chair. We would therefore appeal to you to consider these guiding rulings in order to protect whatever conceivable prejudice Mr. Zuma may suffer going forward. Thank you. Chair, those would be... Chair, I believe that uh, Ms. Nicole Lewis represents Ms. Mentor, and she would like to make some submissions. For our part, we would ask you to refuse the applications for cross-examination by all of these persons. To the extent that we may be mistaken and you come to their assistance, especially the assistance of Mr. Zuma, we would like to ask you to impose a condition 
it's up to him to live up to that undertaking or condition. If not, we will certainly come back to you for a subpoena to compel him to live up to that condition. I was uh, wanting to ask the question in regard to anybody who is within the country, even if they don't give an undertaking, they can be summoned to and called upon to appear here. Yes. And um, and they, in that event, they are obliged to come. Uh, I wonder whether, in regard to those, um, how critical it is to require an undertaking, because in any event, they can be compelled. Yes. Chair, we mm. thought about that. Mm. And we thought the difficulties that would arise are the following. And let me deal with the last part of the concern. And we thought about it. And, mm. and I express the common consent and collective commitment of my colleagues mm. because we have discussed that issue. Mm. If we were to be left to the mercy of the subpoena, mm. we will go through the court processes to authenticate the subpoena. Mm. And that may be five years down the line, mm. instead of the commission completing its work. Mm. But here we have this advantage, mm. that they have elected to participate by cross-examination. Mm. It is that privilege of cross-examination which is mm. the lever that the commission has to impose the condition. Mm. Mm. So that if they start there, mm. they can no longer claim that they're no longer going to participate by testifying, because that's mm. a condition of their right to cross-examination. Mm. At that level, Chair, we yeah. are no longer left to the mercy of the subpoena. Mm. Uh, in, uh, uh, the part of the difference between the two is that, and I guess that's the point you are making, is that uh, if there is an undertaking, uh, then we are assured that we are not going to be subjected to lengthy delays while yes. somebody who wants the benefit of cross-examination from the commission challenging a subpoena yeah. in the courts yeah. uh, over and appealing for whatever number of years. Yes. 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 The question that may arise is whether constitutionally uh, it would be appropriate to attach a condition, the effect of which is to say <coughs> you, you may grant, you, you, I'm granting you leave to cross-examine but that is subject to you waiving your constitutional right to challenge any summons or subpoena that may be issued or order that you must come and give evidence. Um, what do you say about that? Certainly we will cross the more complex questions of constitutionality when we get there. But the first and obvious principle is where it is quite clear mm. that there is a constitutional claim you are entitled to mm. privately to you as an individual, mm. and then you waive it mm. in circumstances where you are not compelled to waive it, mm. it will become difficult in a litigious round mm. to claim that you have a constitutional right that you want to assert in the light of the choice that you have made. Mm. Mm. I don't want to make unfounded propositions, but I foresee that the Commission will have such arguable case in mm. those circumstances. Mm. Mm. Uh, thank you. Those are with our submissions, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Cochran. Thank you, Chairman. 
Yes, uh, in the light of the hour, I'm inclined to say let's agree how much time you will take. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask you if I may for 10 minutes. That's fine, thank you. But as you know, I act for Mr. Jonas, and what I would like to do in those 10 minutes is to make some submissions focused specifically on the position of, of Mr. Jonas. Yes. I'm not going to repeat what has been said by my learned friend, Mr. Maleka. Yes. But what I would like to do, Mr. Chairman, is to approach the matters in a slightly different way, if I may. Yes. And may I start with where our learned friend Mr. Helens began this morning? Yes. He said that you have a discretion whether to allow cross-examination, and he said your discretion was untrammeled. Mm. Well, Chair, the first part of that submission is correct. The second part is incorrect. Mm. It is correct you do have a discretion, but the suggestion that your discretion is untrammeled by principle is simply incorrect. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to do, Chair, in my 10 minutes is to suggest three principles that should guide you when yeah. you come to exercise that discretion. Mm -hmm. May I begin with the first, which is possibly the, the least contentious. Mm -hmm. The first principle is the threshold requirement, Chair, that if you go to Rule 3.4, mm -hmm. you'll know the person must be an implicated person, mm -hmm. and he or she must file a statement in which he responds to the statement implicating him or her and indicates yes. his or her response. Yes. The only reason I draw attention to that is when you in due course come to the position of Ms. Brown, mm -hmm. What you will discover is that Ms. Brown was not a person implicated by Mr. Jonas's testimony. Mm. Chair, with respect, the proposition you put to Mr. Labala is entirely correct. What Mr. Mm. Jonas says is, I attended a meeting at Saxonwold with one of the Guptas, <coughs> mm. and they referred to Ms. Brown. So mm. what could Ms. Brown's counsel possibly say to cross-examine my client in mm. relation to that? Mm. She wasn't at the meeting, mm. and she has no way of disputing what was mm. said. So with respect, there is no implication of Ms. Mm. Brown. We understand that our learned friend, Ms. Mr. Labala, has stood down his application, will consider it in due course. Mm. And all we ask you to do in due course, Chair, when you mm. consider it, is to have mm. regard to the fact that she is not an implicated person. And may we add, Chair, our learned friend says he hasn't seen the statement yeah. of my client, Mr. Jonas, with respect, Chair, I'm told it's on the website of the Commission and has been for some time. Mm -hmm. So that's the first principle, Chair, a relatively non-contentious one. May I come to the second principle that we submit should guide you in the exercise of your discretion? I'm going to call it the principle of symmetry. Mm -hmm. And by symmetry, I mean that my client, Mr. Jonas, should be similarly positioned to the implicated persons who wish to cross-examine him. And it, 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 of the two, namely the witness and the implicated persons, yes. who may be having divergent versions yes. of what happened, who said to who, who yes. said what to whom, mm -hmm. you're saying they must be placed on an equal footing in terms of, that's what you mean by yes. the symmetry principle. Symmetry means they must be placed on an equal footing regarding their procedural rights. Yes. You will in due course decide, Chair, in your yes. hypothetical example, who's telling the truth or not. Yes. The only point we make is when it comes to thrashing out who is telling the truth, yes. the one party cannot be placed in a privileged position vis-a-vis -vis the other party. And, Chair, that leads into two requirements, if I can address them separately. Uh, before you go yes. to them, um, what you mean might include this, that to the extent that there may be case law, such as the one that, uh, the case that uh, Mr. Helens referred to, which I haven't read, uh, 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 he read out an extract, to the effect that there may be cases which in relation to the right to cross-examine, which discuss that right mm. in and may imply that it is fine that the witness should be should not have seen the version of the cross-examiner's client's version. Yes. That might be so in a criminal case 
where the cross-examiner, defense counsel, for example, where his or her client may be facing uh, something very serious yes. because in, in case he or she is found guilty. So maybe to the extent that in that context, the witness and the accused might not be placed on the same equal footing, that might be the explanation. That may be absent in an inquiry such as this, where no finding of no finding made here will lead to anybody being imprisoned. Any finding made here might help the police and prosecuting authorities to make certain decisions, but there will still be other processes like criminal trials where findings could be made that could lead to imprisonment. You're entirely correct, Chair. Mm. My learned friend says that's the first prize when it comes to fleshing out or ascertaining mm. who's telling the truth. Mm. He mm. says the method that we are proposing is the second prize. Mm. Well, with respect, I don't want to say which is the first and which is the second mm. prize, but what I do say mm. is that this commission is tasked with the responsibility of conducting its processes efficiently, mm. and it would be inefficient to run it in the way our learned friend Mr. Mm. Hedden says. Mm. Perhaps, as you put to me, Chair, that could be appropriate in a different context where mm. there's a criminal charge or something yes. of that sort, yes. but not in this context where mm. your job is to investigate the facts and to make a report to the mm. president. Yes. With respect, that's why the principles our learned friend referred to are not appropriate. Chair, if I can just elaborate briefly then on the requirement of symmetry, it has two components from Mr. Jonas's perspective. The first is this, it's to do with the precognition that our learned friend Mr. Hedens refers to. And he says that my client, Mr. Jonas, must complete his evidence in chief and must then face cross-examination at a time when Mr. Jonas has not seen the witness statement of the implicated parties and does not know what their version is. Well, Chair, Ch can I ask you to put yourself in the position of the implicated parties? What do they know about Mr. Jonas when they begin their cross-examination? They've read his witness statement. They've attended his evidence in chief. If they haven't, they've read the transcript and they've seen every document Mr. Jonas relies on. Mm. And the asymmetry with respect is extraordinary. They want my client, Mr. Jonas, to have none of those benefits mm. at the time when he commences or undergoes his cross-examination. Mm. With respect, Chair, there is no merit in that submission. In mm. our respectful submission, my client, Mr. Jonas, should not be situated behind a veil of ignorance when the implicated party is not situated but behind any veil of ignorance. On the contrary, the implicated party has full insight into every aspect of my client's evidence. So, Chair, that would be the first aspect of the symmetrical requirement that we would, with respect, advocate to you. The second is one that's been ventilated before you. Well, my client, Mr. Jonas, volunteers. He comes, he gives evidence. With respect, a party who seeks the leave of you to cross-examine Mr. Jonas mm. must similarly subject himself or herself to the giving of evidence and must undertake to do so. Mm. And Chair, I'm not going to repeat what our learned friend Mr. Maleka has said. We make common cause with it. Mm. May I simply indicate where it goes in relation to the implicated parties who have mm. moved their applications before you. When it comes to Mr. Dudazani Zuma, he has indicated he will not give any evidence before this commission, mm. and we therefore ask that he be refused leave to mm. cross-examine my client, Mr. Jonas. Mm. As regards the Gupta brothers, they say they will give evidence, but not before this commission and not within the borders of South Africa. Mm. We associate ourselves with our learned friend, Mr. Maleko. We ask that they be refused leave to cross-examine my client mm. in circumstances where they will not subject themselves to the giving of evidence before you in mm. South Africa. Mm. And Chair, that brings me to of the... Of course, one approach is to refuse leave on the basis that that's what they have, uh, that's the stance they have taken, namely they, they will not give evidence. Another one is uh, to say, uh, leave is granted, but on condition 
Yes. You 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 change your decision or yes. something to that effect. Yes, Chair. With respect, you're entirely correct. There are yeah. separate ways of getting to the same yeah. point. And yeah. We have we have no preference one way or another. Yeah. Yes. Chair, may I then come the, to the advantage of the the one? Of course, is that if uh, they change the decision, uh, uh, they, they, then uh, they don't have to renew the application, so yes. to speak. Yes. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Uh, or in case they are summoned and they comply mm. and they come and give evidence at that stage, then maybe the the, the, the condition might fall away. Yes. Uh, yeah. You're correct, okay. Chair. There are those differences yes. in the modalities. Yeah. Mm. Chair, thirdly, may I deal with the third principle that we would respectfully urge upon you when you exercise your discretion. Mm. It's one that hasn't received much airtime today, and so I would like to spend a few minutes on it. Mm. We call it the principle of efficiency, simply for the sake of a shorthand. Mm. And efficiency means this, Chair. It means that the cross-examination must be conducted in a manner that is efficient, not just in respect of Mr. Jonas, my client, but also in respect of the way in which this committee will conduct its process and will conclude its report timelessly to submit to the president. And Chair, this is a broader consideration, but it's clearly recognized by your rule 3.7, which says that cross-examination will be permitted when it is in the best interests of the work of the commission. Mm. In other words, Chair, one of the questions you'll ask yourself is, Will allowing the cross-examination mm. result in an outcome that is, the that is in the best interest of the work of the Commission? Mm. And that may well lead to a slightly broader consideration than the interests of Mr. Jonas or any other mm. witness. Mm. And what that means, Chair, is this, and I'm going to repeat briefly what my learned friends have said. It means that the time for cross-examination must be limited. Because if you don't limit it, if there is no guillotine, in all likelihood it will go on well beyond six months, well beyond two mm. years, possibly much longer than that. My understanding is that everybody seems yeah. so far out to accept that there should be that limitation. You're entirely correct, Chair. When we read the, the heads of argument of our learned friends, we thought you they were know. objecting, but yes, they did make yes. the concession this morning. Mm. Mm. May I just add this, Chair? It's not quite the same as a guillotine point. Mm. If you give one hour to every cross-examiner, mm. each of them each of them could then repeat the same cross-examination. Mm. Let me focus on my client, mm. Mr. Jonas. Mm. With respect, that would also be unfair. Mm. You'll know in the High Court, the rule is only one counsel can cross-examine. Mm. In other words, one party can't say, mm. I've got three counsel, each will cross-examine in order to tie the witness yeah, out. No. Well, mm. a very similar principle applies here. If different yeah, cross-examiners yeah, no, Certainly the there cross can be no, no, no doubt about doing it that way. Yes. Um, uh, one of the reasons why there is re the requirement that an implicated person must uh, put up his or her version, full version, is to enable me, if I grant leave to cross them, to take a view about how much time I should grant them yes. because of because I have to look at the divergence in the versions. Uh, so that's part of the reason, part of the reason uh, why it's necessary, but there are other reasons yes. as well. As you please, Chair. Uh. Chair, may I make this final submission still under the heading of the requirement of efficiency? Uh. It's this, unless this commission with respect disciplines the process of cross-examination uh. by timing and other devices, uh. There is, in our respectful submission, a real risk mm. that future potential witnesses mm. may refuse to come forward. Mm. And this was alluded to by my learned friend, Mr. Mm. Maleka. My client, I'm instructed, has spoken to potential witnesses mm. who have seen him give evidence. He was mm. the first witness before this commission. Mm. And have indicated they may reconsider their willingness to come forward in the future mm -hmm. if they are going to be subjected to days and days of cross-examination. Mm -hmm. And so the submission we make is this. The way <coughs> in which this commission regulates the process of cross-examination mm -hmm. is not just important to my client, Mr. Mm -hmm. Jonas, when mm -hmm. he undergoes cross-examination. Mm -hmm. It's of tremendous importance 
to the workings of this commission. Mm. Because, Chair, when we started today, I believe the first thing you said is you extended again your invitation to mm. parties who have something to say to come and give evidence. Mm. Mm. And the only submission we make is those parties, <coughs> in considering whether to step forward voluntarily or not, mm. will mm. be watching what happens with the mm. cross-examination of people mm. such as my client, yeah. Mr. Jonas. Mm. And so, Chair, where all of that goes is we would commend those three principles to you when you exercise your discretion and what they mean for the only implicated parties who are still relevant. What they mean <coughs> is this. My client opposes the application by Lynn Brown to cross-examine him because she is not an implicated person. My client, Mr. Jonas, opposes the application by the Gupta brothers for leave to cross-examine him since they will not undertake or commit to give evidence in South Africa. My client opposes the application for leave by Mr. Dudazani Zuma for, to cross-examine him since he has indicated he will give no evidence at all. My client, Mr. Jonas, opposes the contention of our learned friends that he should complete his evidence in chief without having had any sight of their version or of their statement. And finally, Chair, we oppose any suggestion that the process of cross-examination of my client or anyone else should not be subject to the rigor and the discipline that this commission may decide to impose upon it. Oh. Chair, that is the position of my client, Mr. Jonas. Chair, if I, can, if I can abuse the podium briefly to indicate, there are two of my learned friends who have indicated they wish to make submissions for their clients. <coughs> yes. The one is Ms. Nicole Lewis, who wishes to make very brief submissions for Ms. Mentor. Mm -hmm. And then, Chair, my learned friend Mr. Baum um, mm -hmm. arrived after lunch. Yeah. As I understand his handwritten note, he mm -hmm. wishes to make two brief submissions to you on yeah. behalf of Mr. Maseku. Yes. I hope I've read his handwriting correct. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Lewis, are you coming? Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm aware that I come towards the tail end of a relatively long day, yes. and I don't propose to repeat any of the submissions that my learned friends have made. Uh. I would just like to deal first briefly with the submissions that have been made by Mr. Helens. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, you are for Ms. Mentor? I'm here for Ms. Mentor. Okay. The submissions as to the unlimited nature of cross-examination. Mm. I understand that the issue of time has now been dealt with, and I understand that issue to be resolved. Mm. But, Chair, there is a further issue that mm. arises from Mr. Gupta's submissions, and that is as to the issue, uh, as to the issue of topics that an implicated party may canvas in his or her cross-examination. Mm. And we understand Mr. Helen's submission to be that there should also be no limitation with regards to that. Mm. Mr. Chair, our submission is that would be inconsistent with Rule 3.4 of the Commission's rules, which provide in relevant part that the application of an implicated party must be accompanied by a statement responding to the witness's statement insofar as it implicates him or her, and the statement must make it clear what parts of the witness's statement are disputed or denied, and the grounds upon which those parts are disputed or denied. Uh -huh. And so, Mr. Chair, we submit that it's, it is clear from that rule uh -huh. that implicated parties are limited to, to the issues that implicate them in the witness's testimony. Yeah, I... I, I, I I doubt whether Mr. Helens may have meant anything that goes against that that that, that rule. He nods. I think he, he understands, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And then, Chair, I, I propose to, to deal very briefly with the issues of, um, of precognition and the issue of testifying via video link. But I, proceed, uh, I propose to do that through the prism of Section 9.1 um, of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Chair, I, I don't want to be, uh, I would like to just make clear at the outset that we support the submissions that have been made by my learned friends, Mr. Maleka and Mr. Cockrell. 
um, as to fairness and efficiencies. But there is a further consideration here, Chair, which we would submit is really determinative of the issue. And that is Section 9.1 of the Constitution, which provides that all, uh, all persons are equal before the law. And in particular, the manner in which the Constitutional Court applied that principle to litigants in the Biowatch judgment. And Chair, the relevant reference there is the South African Law Reports, 2009, 6, um, at page 232. And the paragraph is paragraph 17. And Mr. Chair, in, in, in that paragraph, what the Constitutional Court said is that when parties assert their rights in a court, before a court, they must be approached impartially by the court and they must be, uh, they must be accorded equal status. The court stated that one party should not be treated advantageously or disadvantageously in relation to any other party. And Chair, we submit that that principle is applicable here. And, and it is applicable to the issues of precognition, firstly. As my learned friends have pointed out, the implicated parties have had the advantage of witness statements given well in advance, of listening to oral testimony, of having the transcript, and of having every document that has been put to the witnesses. It would be, in, in those circumstances, it would be inconsistent with Section 9.1 of the Constitution to, to allow for cross-examination in circumstances where the witnesses have not even had sight of the implicated party <coughs> um, And so that's to the issue of precognition. And, and then similarly, uh, Mr. Chair, in relation to, to the issue of testifying via video link, the witnesses have taken the, the risk and the, the, the inconvenience and everything that comes with it. You heard my client's plea, Ms. Mentor, as to the very real concerns that she has to her safety. Despite that, Chair, she has come here to assist this commission with its extremely important mandate. And it would be, in, in those circumstances, absent it being strictly necessary in the interest of justice for one of the implicated parties to testify outside the borders of South Africa and video link, we would submit that it would be inconsistent, and, uh, inconsistent with and thus a violation of Section 9.1 of the Constitution for, for the implicated parties to be allowed to testify in, in, those, in that situation. In other words, without presenting themselves before this commission and subjecting themselves to its authority with all of the safeguards that flow from that. And we would make common cause with, with our learned friends for both the Commission um, and for Mr. Jonas that the reasons that have been advanced by the implicated parties simply do not constitute suffi a sufficient basis for, for that privilege to be granted. Those are our submissions. Thank you very much, Ms. Lewis. Mr. Baum. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Mr. Commissioner, I'm not going to be more than five minutes. Thank you. And I'm going to make two points. Thank you. And I make these points on specifically on behalf of Mr. Maseko in the context of what he said already and what he has done. Mm. Mr. Commissioner, on the first point regarding testifying outside of the country, mm. the point being dealt with, mm. as I understand it, the point is based on a suggestion that Mr. Gupta does not want to come, does not want to, come to South Africa because he does not trust or is disparaging of the law enforcement agencies. Mm. Of course, the implication of finding in favor of him on that is far-reaching, mm. because if the commission were to find in favor of him on that basis, mm. the commission effectively buys into that criticism mm. of the law enforcement agencies. Mm. Now, I raise this in the context of Mr. Maseko, because you'll recall his evidence when he said, now, at the end of the day, you may agree with him, disagree with him, but as it stands at the moment, mm. where he said he turned down Mr. Gupta because of the irregularity and unlawfulness of the conduct. Mm. Assuming you were to find that he was right mm. in his characterization, mm. you can hardly then refer the matter to the very law enforcement agencies mm. who you, whose disparagement you have bought into mm. on this application. Mm. And what hope does anybody else who hopes for a positive outcome other than a glossy report, a positive outcome through prosecution when necessary, have if the law enforcement agencies who will give effect to that have been tainted with the brush that 
Mr. Ajay Gupta wants this commission to take them with. In relation that that uh, that goes uh, to the issue that I raised uh, with Mr. Helens and I mentioned to Mr. Maleka, isn't it, that, or oh, you might not have been here, that uh, I said, I asked whether it can be said that, that uh, in law, the Gupta, the Gupta brothers, Mr. Ajay Gupta and Mr. Rajesh Gupta, have a lawful reason Absolutely. for refusing to come back to South Africa and give evidence like every witness before me here. I take it a step and, further. Uh, and uh, you might have had when you might have been yeah. here when I mentioned to Mr. Maleka what uh, Mr. Helen's answer was. All I'm saying is that it goes a step further mm. because not only does it raise the question of their, the lawfulness of their reason, mm. but they want you. And if you put it in a nutshell, mm. and I'm going to be as blunt as I understand Mr. Helen's was. Mm. They want you to categorize the law enforcement agencies mm. and by extension the court system, because that's a, mm. the safety mechanism, mm. as unreliable, incompetent, and whatever, mm. other, whatever other unfortunate words we use mm. to mm. describe them. Mm. At the moment you do that, mm. then you might as well give up the commission now, mm. because you can never mm. refer matters which require further action mm. to those very law enforcement agencies. Mm. It becomes absurd. Mm. The second matter I want to deal with is uh, don't give him my version, and this is in relation to Mr. Maseko. Until the, I'll give it to him for the first time when he's been cross-examined. And there's a point of departure which is simply incorrect. Mm. And that point of departure is that somehow if Mr. Maseko, don't use the word precognized, it's just wrong. Mm. If Mr. Maseko is put in a position to properly prepare for cross-examination. Mm. Somehow that is going to undermine the efficacy of cross-examination. Mm. I put it to you, uh, Chairperson, that you just got to utter the proposition mm. to appreciate the absurdity of that. Mm. This is not about taking people by surprise. Mm. It's a phrase that I've used from time to time previously. Mm. Cross-examination in a circumstance such as this is not a game. Mm. It's about uncovering facts. Mm. And you don't uncover facts by testing somebody's memory under surprise in cross-examination. You do so in circumstances where the person has had the opportunity to prepare and then you test the person fairly. Now, I say this again in the context of what Mr. Maseko has said. Mr. Maseko's starting point was the refusal of an offer. An offer he could refuse. And he did refuse. But thereafter, he was the first and only to respond to the call by Mr. Mantashe. Mm. He then responded to the public protector. Mm. He went with other DGs public. Mm. He spoke openly to the SIU. Mm. And he played his cards openly, mm. and he put them on the table for all to see. Mm. He was asked during his examination by Mr. Maleka whether to the best of his knowledge mm. there was any substantive response to what he had to say. And his answer was no. In other words, to this day, Nobody has said, you're lying, what you said was wrong. Uh, leave aside plain denials because they make no sense. They don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And in those circumstances, mm -hmm. they still want the surprise factor to crop, creep into his cross-examination. Mm -hmm. There's something remarkably wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And I say, it, what's remarkably wrong with it mm -hmm. is the point of departure mm -hmm. that if he's precognized, somehow that will give him the opportunity to prepare mm -hmm. and change his version. Mm -hmm. It assumes a potentially dishonest ver uh, witness who will change his version simply because he's been presented with another uh, version. But it, it, there's just no basis for that. Well, you were not here in the morning when... I'm terribly sorry about I that. I kind of put that proposition to Mr. Helens mm. uh, to say, well, if a witness is honest, uh, really, you know, what's wrong if he hears or she hears what the version of the implicated person is, because that witness uh, may well be able to say, no, now I see, I think I was mistaken in regard to this, having regard to this response. Uh, here, I'm sure I'm, I'm right. Mm -hmm. you know. and, and, and my difficulty with that submission and that response 
is it prima facie assumes mm. that Mr. Maseko could be dishonest. Mm. Now, you can't make that finding. Mm. You, can't, you can't convey to Mr. Maseko mm. that you accept Mr. Helms' submission, mm. that perhaps you will tamper with his evidence. Mm. That's suggesting to him that you think he might be dishonest. Mm. There's just something fundamentally flawed mm. with it. So on the two, on the two issues, uh, the, 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 the suggestion from us in relation to the first issue is not to dismiss the application on account of the testimony outside of the country issue, because that would suggest you closing the door. It would be to grant him leave to cross-examine mm -hmm. on the basis that he's present in the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, if he then does not make use of the opportunity, mm -hmm. it will be out of an, a limitation he imposed on himself. Mm -hmm. In relation to the <coughs> second issue... Excuse me. Uh, that may be more or less like what uh, uh, I put to... To Mr. Council. Cockrell. Yeah, to yeah. say, you know, there might be different ways of formulating yeah. the same thing because uh, even with uh, <coughs> Mr. Ajay Gupta and uh, Mr. Rajesh Gupta, uh, if if they if I refuse them leave to cross them now on the basis of the stand they have taken now, uh, if they were later on to change their stance uh, and come back to South Africa uh, while there was still time there may be, well be a ground to then grant them leave when they say we are here. Um, uh, so, so one might, if one said, says one is refusing it, one might formulate it on the understanding that the only reason why it's refused is because of this, but if this falls away, you may be allowed uh, but um, there may be two situations, theoretically at least, uh, scenarios in which they could be back in South Africa. One could be if they change their minds on this, on this issue, which from what I've read seems highly unlikely. Um, another one could be if at some stage while there is, this commission is going on, uh, the, it could be found that the instruments are created that um, allow them to be brought back against their will. I, I want to suggest that there's a different reason why you should formulate it in the manner you suggested yes. to my learned friend, Mr. Cockrell. Yes. And that's because you're not closing the door on anybody. Yes. What you're saying to them on that formulation yeah is that to the extent that you have a contrary version, I have no difficulty with you cross-examining. Mm. But you're going to cross-examine and be treated like every other witness is being treated. Mm. In other words, it's a positive invitation to them mm. To, mm. to come and testify yeah. and to cross-examine. Yeah. And to the extent that they place a limitation, mm -hmm. they're placing a limitation on their own right that you're giving to them. And it seems to me that that that's probably that probably better captures mm. the debate around the point. Well, it, it may it may be that uh, there are some positive things or features about formulating it mm. that way. To even though in effect it might be the same, even if you kind of refused mm. on the understanding that if the situation changed, um, then you would allow them. What does, I mean, even if you were to say you refuse, what does remain is they are the ones who on their own version have taken themselves outside of this process. If they don't get a chance to, if they don't get granted leave to cross-examine, it's because of their own decisions decision to leave the country, then the decision to say we are not coming back because we have no faith mm. in the legal system of South Africa, despite the fact that they themselves are able to say, 
look at the judiciary of South Africa. We have won some cases before the judges of South Africa, but we, we are not going back there. We will never go back to South Africa, if I understand what they say in the written submissions of their counsel correctly. Bo both achieve the same end. Yeah, Just speaking yeah. for my, and let me yes. put it bluntly, speaking for my client. Yeah. He's put his version on record time and time again. Yes. He'd been through a harrowing experience. Mm. He'd love it mm. for them to come and test him yes. on that version. Yes. And that's why he'd love them to be told, <coughs> please yes. come. We yes. welcome you coming. Well, if I, you don't I, want to come, that's your choice. I, I can tell you that, uh, I mean, I've already indicated in regard to uh, some of the implicated persons that uh, I will grant them, uh, I, I have granted them leave to cross-examine. And um, Mr. Ajay Gupta uh, is, uh, and Mr. Rajesh Gupta, but definitely Mr. Ajay Gupta, is uh, very seriously implicated, and therefore I would want to grant him leave to to be able to cross-examine him, to come and give evidence and be cross-examined himself. But, uh, but that is, if having regard to all the circumstances, I find that uh, I ought to exercise my discretion in his favor. And as things stand, and uh, anyone who was listening to argument this morning would know that I am quite concerned about uh, the stance they have taken of, say, well, one, uh, getting themselves out of the country, two, deciding that they will not return to South Africa to take part in these proceedings or for any reason, as I understand their position, and saying that they don't trust, uh, uh, be, that is because they don't trust uh, uh, the Hawks and the, uh, the NPA or whatever other institution, th those are factors that are seriously um, uh, uh, are matters that uh, uh, I have to look at very carefully in making my decision, but they, they are matters that uh, are of serious concern uh, to me to say, how can you want to enjoy the benefits of a legal system, of the institutions of this legal system, benefits of cross-examination, but you say you don't have faith in that legal system, you are not prepared to subject yourself to the authority of the courts and institutions of that legal system. Uh, how can you tell uh, a body such as this that you want to participate, but you want to participate in its proceedings in, on your own terms. Just to summarize then, and I state this with the authority and on behalf of my client, Mr. Temba Maseko, mm -hmm. he would welcome any challenge to his testimony mm -hmm. by Mr. Ajay Gupta provided Mr. Gupta subjects himself to the same rules, regulations, and seat as all the other witnesses. Yes. In relation to the version of Mr. Gupta, Mr. Maseko waits with bated breath for that version to be supplied to him. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to even cast the slightest doubt mm -hmm. on whether he will tailor his evidence accordingly thereafter, and he's ready to receive the witness statement mm -hmm. and subject to what he said relating to the first point to be cross-examined on that. Mr. Maseko has made it clear time and again by cooperating with every possible body, person or institution who has called for people to come out openly. I think he may well be the only person mm -hmm. who's, who's, who's been open and forthcoming at every turn. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Bam. <coughs> well, we have uh, reached the, I, th I, th I hope there's nobody else left. I think there isn't. I think we have reached the end of uh, today. Mr. Moleka, 
Uh, we, we are going, or oh, you, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm not going be, to say be, before, before you do that, now I just remember, I just said we have reached the end, but Mr. Helens may and others may or may not want to respond. <laughs> Mr. Helens, uh, I don't know whether you would like to respond. Probably you would. I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's been a long day. Yes, um, I would like to respond. I see it's four o'clock, but, mm. but I'd like to respond. Yeah. Um, of course, you have had some of the uh, questions I've put to yes. Mr. Malega and so on. You can deal with all of them. Yes. Look, uh, all these arguments about symmetry and fairness, they're wonderful arguments and um, they sound very attractive. But at the end of the day, let us take Ms. Fakey Mentor's evidence. She says she was offered a position of a Minister of State by Mr. Gupta. He has a contrary version and a very strongly contrary version, powerfully put before you, um, and it won't be tested. And what are we inquiring into? Uh, yes, state capture. Her evidence says there was state capture. It won't be cross-examined. Uh, Mr. Maseku, it's narrower, but it's, there's a fundamental difference. Not simply a mere deny, deny, deny. There's an essence to it which is fundamental. It won't be tested. You, sir, will one day have to decide, was there state capture? Those fundamental witnesses will not have been cross-examined and you won't have heard the evidence of the Guptas. Now, what value will that finding be? It will be much diminished in value and much diminished in use to investigating authorities later and to possible prosecution authorities later, either positively or negatively, because it may be that that evidence is shown to be uh, substantially incorrect and that therefore there would not be a prosecution later. Now, it is not so that to um, set conditions as it's put uh, is, is to fly in the face of the way the judiciary operates. The, ever, the um, examples that I'm instructed to give, however insulting those examples might be found to be by certain people, they are what the Guptas experienced and what they are experiencing at the moment. Uh, your Lordship, not, <laughs> Mr. Commissioner, not um, jokingly uh, do you say that if they're being prosecuted by incompetent people, what, what a glorious situation, you'll just be acquitted. The converse is the position here. If the people are incompetent and they reach a conclusion that they should prosecute when they should not have so reached, you are in their thrall. And you're in their thrall for the moment of arrest through bail proceedings until one day there's a completed docket. And no court can be approached to set aside a decision to prosecute by way of review or otherwise when you don't even have the material on which they've made that decision. So those are the experiences of my clients and I wish the, them to be conveyed to you. With regard to the caravan of this commission traipsing to wherever it mooted Dubai, we never said Dubai, but that possibly could be a venue. That's not necessarily so. It could simply be that with one person traveling over there to ensure that the video conferencing setup is set up, this entire commission can operate with that video camera uh, trained on the equivalent of that witness box in whatever venue, and with cross-examination and leading of evidence and questions by yourself taking place as if that um, witness box uh, were actually there, but it's actually somewhere else. It's not convoluted at all. So, um, with regard to the undertaking um, to participate in the manner we've suggested, not being on oath, there's, there's not a point. That is the undertaking. If the commissioner were wanted on oath, we can file a supplementary statement saying exactly what the heads of argument state. Um, uh, if there is non-cooperation in cross-examination, well, the commission and the evidence leaders would be armed with the argument well, there's an inference to be drawn now, not merely from the absence and non-cooperation, which presence and cooperation is tendered in the form that they've tendered it, but there would be a, a person saying, I'm not answering that question, when in all right, the question is properly asked, and unless the question is asked, answered, 
it would clear, uh, it clearly indicate guilt. So you would deprive yourself and you would not demean the justice system in this country by, uh, by um, not allowing um, that process. My learned friend, Mr. Maleka, speaks of the public interest uh, being served and the interest of justice being served. Why would the public interest and the interest of justice not be served if under uh, controlled circumstances you heard their evidence and then the integrity um, uh, of, of your finding, not based on inferences and absence of cross-examination and absence of evidence, uh, would be not subject to scrutiny or, um, or criticism. Let me say this with the de deepest respect. You can only work with the evidence and the cross-examination of the evidence that comes before you. If the Guptas are not before you, by your own decision and perhaps your decision blaming them for their decision, they're still absent. And you would have a limping conclusion or finding or recommendation based on inference and absence, not on exposure to evidence. Um, so uh, we've dealt with whether they're fugitives from, from justice. <laughs> My learned friends and you, uh, honorable sir, have the straight choice. Get to the bottom of it, find out the truth um, in unwatered down interrogative, investigatory and commission of inquiry fashion. The best interests of justice are served <coughs> by the lodestone of pursuing the truth. The true north for this commission is the truth. And an accommodation made in very difficult and different circumstances is, is, is a price that this commission should pay in order to follow the lodestone <coughs> which will lead it to the truth. On precognition, uh, um, various phrases are used, browbeating the witness, symmetry, etc. But we know um, that the power of cross-examination lies in an element of surprise. There is the power of re-examination. There is um, enough fluidity, balance, uh, and direction from this commission to offset all those things. We simply say on the latter uh, issue of pre uh, precognition, uh, that um, the, the, the cutting edge tool of cross-examination is best achieved without precognition. I don't retreat from that stance. I uh, emphatically in, insist that it is correct. But so, that's so, Mr. Helens, you say for cross-examination to be effective, there must be some element of ambush. Uh, people chuckle and you use the word ambush, but it's not really. It's not really ambush, it's what we experience in our courts. I go back, I think my learned friend says, I, I, maybe he made a mistake or I misheard him. He said, I never answered your question about um, motion proceedings referred to evidence or to trial. I did most... No, you did, <coughs> you did answer. And, and, and our, well, uh, and, and our uh, uh, you, you did give a certain answer. Mm. Uh, he might or might not agree with it, but you did give But I did answer. answer. And, and, our, and the answer was that it's a second-rate option. The first-rate mm. option is the option that we choose in trials. Mm. And especially on these contentious issues, you, sir, are aware of the difference, for example, between Mr. A.J. Gupta and Ms. Mentor. Mm. Um, Think, think about it. I'm not going to mention it. Think of the annexures. Think of the direct difference. And then think of a consultation where she is ex exposed to all of this. Think of the witness herself. Let me know, not prejudge her performance, but it wasn't stellar. Um, and then think of the testing mechanism of, uh, of cross-examination without precognition. It's not an ambush. It is the ultimate test for, ver for veracity and reliability. But let me end because I think I've been quite quick, actually. Um, and by the way, a fine in pounds would be unconstitutional, not for the reasons that occur to you, but it would be cruel and unusual punishment. Um, the lodestone is the truth, sir. The lodestone is the truth, and that's what you must pursue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Helens. Can I take it that all other counsel who had uh, 
said they associated themselves with Mr. Helen's main address on uh, uh, certain issues that he has responded on. Can I take it that they associate themselves with his reply as well, and they do not wish to add anything in reply? Indeed so, Mr. J. I've got nothing good. You have got nothing. Mr. Cowley? Thank you. Uh, who else? Uh, no, he was, uh, his one is different. Okay, all right. It looks like everybody concerned associates themselves with that. Mr. Malega? Chair, just about the way forward. Yes. Um, as I have it, yes. the next witness will testify on Monday, yeah. which means the commission would not sit tomorrow. Yeah. But certainly you, the members of your legal team have other work to do. Yeah. In the yeah. best interest of the commission. Yeah. <coughs> All right. We can. Are we going to have one witness on Monday? As far as I have it, Chair, but I can clear mm. that with Mr. Pretorius. Okay. All right. Um, uh, let us say, therefore, that we'll adjourn to 10 o'clock on Monday. There might be. I might advise that we should start maybe 30 minutes later if um, a certain commitment on Monday morning connected with the work of the Commission happens. But I, will, I would indicate uh, in due course if that were to happen. If I don't indicate, then we'll start at 10 o'clock. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much to all council for all your submissions in regard to those uh, applications in respect of which I have not given a decision. Uh, I will reserve decision and in due course you will be advised. Um, uh, I'm hoping that early next week I could uh, indicate when next week I could give the decision. The, the aspect of um, uh, uh, precognition and showing the version to the witness, of course, would apply to any one of the other applications who may have had an op a problem with that, but my understanding is that their uh, ability to, or their position to say they would give evidence didn't seem to indicate that there would be a problem, but whatever ruling I make in that regard would apply to all of them. Thank you. Okay, we adjourn.